Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our briefing. Let me start with uh, several announcements. First, I'd like to welcome uh, eight visiting journalists from uh, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, who are here as part of a United States Information Service program, and they'll be here for two weeks. Welcome. Second, I'd like to uh, remind uh, you of uh, the fact that Secretary Cohen and Deputy Secretary Hamry will be at the Defense Logistics uh, Agency headquarters at Fort Belvoir tomorrow at 10 to open the Joint Electronic Commerce Program Office. Uh, Dr. Hamry will take some questions afterwards um, if you have anything to ask him about the Joint Electronic Program Office. Prior to that, Secretary Cohen is going to appear at the uh, Chamber of Commerce in downtown Washington on Lafayette Square as uh, part of the uh, ceremonies um, in honor of the employer's pledge for support of the uh, National Guard and Reserve that will be at 8 a.m. and that will be open to the press, although I don't think he's planning to take any questions. We are going to, um, because of your interest in both these topics, Charlie, we're going to pipe these, uh, uh, we're going to attempt to pipe these events back into the Pentagon so you could we pipe them directly to your house? Maybe there's some way you can call up and get a telephone feed from... Uh... <laughs> uh, now, this is an interesting human, human uh, interest story coming up here. Uh, tomorrow afternoon at 6 uh, at the Navy Memorial, uh, Secretary Dalton will announce the winner of a nationwide Name That Ship contest involving um, uh, schools around the country. They invited uh, students around the country to suggest names for uh, uh, a new uh, oceanographic survey ship, and the winner will be announced uh, tomorrow afternoon at 6, and I'm sure that you'll want to be there. Um, uh, the uh, two finalists, just to let you know that this is a serious contest, are, are the Oaklawn Element El Oak Elementary School in Cranston, Rhode Island, and uh, uh, St. Martin Luther School in Annapolis, Maryland. And the USS Michael Jordan of the USS well, there are there are two uh, uh, two possibilities here. One, first of all, these are going to be um, leased commercial ships, so they have the uh, the term USNS before them rather than USS. And uh, one is the uh, Bruce C. Hazen, and the second is the uh, uh, Coriolis. Those are the two uh, competing names. And uh, if you're interested in this, I have biographies of Bruce C. Hazen and um, also uh, an explanation of the name Coriolis, if you'd like to pursue this further, which I hope you will. Uh, finally, on, uh, on Tuesday, I, uh, I stated in response to a question from Mr. Sloyan that, uh, that uh, Dr. Gansler felt he had been misquoted in an article. Um, Dr. Gansler does not feel that he was misquoted in the article, and I apologize for, uh, for saying that he'd been misquoted. And with that, I'll take your questions. Yes. Ken, the Secretary was asked yesterday, his appearance with the British Defense Minister, about the possibility of U.S. and NATO forces being sent to Kosovo, and he recited a, a litany of, of cautions like he has before about clear mission, difficulty, exit strategy, et cetera. Is the Secretary as, as uh, reluctant uh, uh, to become involved militarily in Kosovo as he was in Bosnia? Well, first, um, every time we, th we uh, consider uh, the possible commitment of force, uh, we have to look at a whole series of tough questions, and one is, what's the mission? Can we accomplish the mission? What's the exit strategy? Um, what sort of force protection measures would we need if, uh, and challenges would we face if we, uh, if we deployed forces? Um, so these are very standard questions that are asked every time the question of uh, deploying forces comes up. In the In the case of Kosovo, as you know, no one has made any decision to deploy forces into Kosovo or into Albania or Macedonia beyond the forces that are already there. What is happening is that NATO has uh, sent an assessment team into the area. I believe it's in Macedonia today and it'll be in Albania in a day or two to survey the situation 
and to recommend options back to NATO. What they're looking at are the possibility uh, of, of deploying uh, a preventive force into Albania or enhancing the preventive force that is already in Macedonia at this time. No decisions have been made, and uh, they probably won't be for some time. Uh, we believe that the best solution to this problem is a diplomatic solution. The solution to Bosnia was a diplomatic solution. The Dayton Accord was an act of diplomacy, which brought peace to that area. We believe that um, diplomacy can resolve this problem as well. And I understand that uh, President Milosevic of uh, Serbia and, uh, and Mr. Rogova, the, uh, Al the Kosovar Albanian leader, are supposed to meet again on Friday. Again, is the, is the Secretary himself personally reluctant to get involved in this as he was in Bosnia? Is he going to take a lot of convincing? We're not anywhere near that stage. We're at a NATO assessment stage right now. And the view of this government, and Secretary Cohen is very much a part of this government, is that it's time to rely on diplomacy to solve this, uh, to solve this problem. That's what we're, uh, we're banking on now. We've put a lot of effort into making diplomacy work. As you know, uh, Ambassador Holbrook and uh, Mr. Gelbart have been over there. Um, we are prepared to look at other ways to uh, jumpstart diplomacy. Um, uh, uh, Chris Hill, the ambassador to Macedonia, has been placed in charge of trying to make diplomacy work. Um, I believe he'll be in Pristina on Friday, where um, uh, Mr. Milosevic and Mr. Rogova are supposed to meet. Yes, Just Bill. To follow, to follow on Kosovo. Sure. Uh, the Kosovars on Friday told the press that President Clinton had, had promised them that there would not be another Bosnia in Kosovo. The wires yesterday, Ken, uh, were very explicit about towns being leveled by tanks, one, one village or, or small town after another uh, by, the, by the Serbs. So there's over 200 dead so far. Is, isn't there some, some rush to get some, some, some kind of a solution uh, in this matter? There is. And uh, as I said, we've, uh, we've been working hard on diplomatic solutions, which we think are the ultimate way to resolve this. Um, as you know, last week in Luxembourg, the NATO foreign ministers took several actions. They agreed to um, enhance um, uh, the uh, PFP exercises planned in Albania and Macedonia, which are ways of increasing uh, uh, the military presence in those areas. We've uh, agreed to provide some support to Albania in uh, dealing with uh, refugees, uh, helping them to rebuild their own for their armed forces, and other actions that we think will uh, will strengthen uh, forces along the border. And as I said, there's a NATO assessment team in the area today looking at future options. We have not foreclosed any option. We have not foreclosed any military option. Um, we, the United States, nor has NATO foreclosed any military option. But we want to look at the situation, and that's what we're doing. In the meantime, we hope diplomacy will continue. Now, I think that uh, th there have been very disturbing reports about uh, 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 a, uh, a very violent, disproportionate, even vicious response by the Serb authorities involving police and uh, army units, which is a worrisome escalation um, if uh, Serbian army units are involved in, in um, attacks against uh, Kosovar Albanians. But we don't have a good assessment of what's going on there. We take these reports very seriously. We're not denying the reports, but we don't have a clear assessment of what's going on because contrary to an agreement that Milosevic has signed, he has not allowed monitors into that area to report on what's going on. Um, I think we are taking this very seriously. I think the fact that President Clinton met with Mr. Rogova shows that we're taking this seriously. I think the fact that Mr. Holbrook and Mr. Gelbart have been uh, to the area to meet with Milosevic and others shows we're taking it seriously. And I think the actions of the NATO officials in Brussels last week and the, and the fact that a NATO assessment team is there now shows that we're taking it seriously. Appear to be ethnic cleansing that's in progress. Well, it's certainly a uh, a disproportionate uh, 
um, is, uh, I think, a disproportionate and unnecessary and a, a very violent and vicious response to what is going on. Yes. Uh, given the, the reported increase of, of uh, violence along the, around the border villages in Kosovo, has there been any indication of any Albanian troop movement or, or strengthening of its forces uh, along that area? Along the border area? Uh, with, with the Kosovo? Are you asking if Albania is strengthening its force along its own border to, uh, uh, to pre is that what you're asking me? Over a, a violence. Um, I'm not aware that there's been a significant change in the border area, but it, there may have been, and I may have just missed it, but I'm not aware of it. Are there any, uh, any other Al Albanian military moves aside from the border? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, the Albanian military was, uh, um, lost a lot of ground um, in the uh, uh, when the uh, previous government fell. Um, one of the things they lost was uh, many weapons, uh, many of which we believe went into uh, the Kosovo province. Um, maybe as many as uh, as 800,000 small arms um, into the uh, province of uh, of uh, of Kosovo. I mean, they lost accountability of that many. They may not all have gone into Kosovo. Some may still be in Albania. I think it would be hard to parse out how many went to Kosovo and how many remained in Albania. Jim? Uh, if there is a consensus or a decision by NATO on the need for a preventive force, um, uh, would the United States uh, be prepared to contribute ground troops? Well, I think we have to wait until NATO decides, um, until it makes a recommendation. Obviously, we're a very important part of NATO, and um, we've made a uh, major investment in uh, stability in that area, and I anticipate that we'll continue to make an investment in stability in that area. But I think it's premature now to talk about what our reaction will be to a, a report that hasn't even been made yet. What is our recommendation to NATO? Have we made one yet? Wait, why would we make a recommendation until until NATO uh, uh, gets the facts? I mean, we clearly voted in favor of uh, of taking these actions that I enumerated earlier in Luxembourg last week, and uh, we supported sending an assessment team into the area. In fact, we're supporting it with helicopters and communications uh, technicians and equipment. So we're involved in this assessment team, and we'll uh, look at the uh, results when they complete their work. Yes. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the U.S. troops in Macedonia were originally put there to prevent sort of a wider Balkan war, if mm -hmm. you will. Does, does the instance in Kosovo does not fall into that? I mean, I guess my question is, why are they there? And, well, and they, were, they were there to do what they've done very successfully, which is to prevent fighting from spilling from Serbia into Macedonia. That has not happened, and that's what they're there to prevent. And they continue to prevent that. Yes. Uh, two questions. Any thought of a humanitarian mission to aid the refugees that are in uh, Albania? And when uh, when will that NATO assessment team be finished with its work? Well, I think it's uh, well. I think that the whole mission is about five days long. So they'll probably finish it by the end of this week or during the weekend. Um, in terms of humanitarian aid, there has been an increase in humanitarian aid in the area, and the State Department has some figures on increase aid from U.S. AID. Um, I'm sure they'd be glad to give you that. There's been um, the uh, United Nations uh, High Commissioner on Refugees uh, has a fairly um, coherent plan for dealing with refugees. They figured out uh, how many they can deal with in current buildings they've got there. Uh, how many uh, tents they have to bring into the area to deal with refugees. Now, this is all based on the fact that um, uh, there are, I think, so far been about 4,000 refugees that have gone across the border into Albania that we know of. Now, there may be other refugees who have gone across and stayed with families and have not reported to international authorities, so the number could be higher than 4,000. But um, the, uh, the UN has been working on refugee resettlement and, and aid. No DOD involvement right now? No, um, but one of the reasons we have international organizations is so we don't have to do all of these things. And this is what the UN High Commission on Refugees does and does very well. Will the military committee report to the defense ministers? 
next week. Well, certainly Kosovo, certainly Kosovo will be an important issue before the defense ministers in, uh, in Brussels uh, next week. Um, whether they'll be ready to make a decision, I don't know. Uh, I think that um, it was very clear from, uh, from Minister Robertson's remarks yesterday and I think very clear from uh, Minister Rua's remarks a couple of weeks ago that we're not alone in looking for a diplomatic solution to this problem. Uh, many other NATO allies believe that diplomacy is the best way to settle the problem, and uh, that's what we'll continue to work on. Ernie. Does the United States military have enough forces to uh, sufficient to contribute to any possible uh, military presence in Kosovo? Without well, a doubt. Without a doubt, if we were called upon to do that, um, uh, we could do that. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, reports that um, that army army units may may be involved in the latest uh, in the latest uh, violence in, in Kosovo. If if uh, would, would the use of, of army units would that cross a line that would trigger a response? Um, the the answer to that question is complex. Um, the real issue is to stop the violence, whether it's, whether it's the result of action by the special police, the so-called MUP, or whether it's the result of actions by the Army. Um, it's less important who perpetrates the violence as what's less important is, is who perpetrates it. What's more important is that the violence stop. The uh, Army has uh, been in the border area for some time, and uh, uh, much of the evidence suggests that what the Army has been doing has been trying to uh, create a, uh, a, a sort of a smuggler-free zone along the border, maybe of two to five kilometers in width. And that seems to be where most of the Army activity has taken place. Um, there was an attack against um, the MUP and maybe against uh, some Army units uh, in the interior a couple of days ago, and the military did respond, I believe, with tanks um, to uh, defend the uh, targets of that attack. The attack was by the, uh, the Kosovar Albanian forces, or the so-called UK, U-C-K. Uh, so I think the degree of Army involvement right now is not entirely clear. And one of the reasons for that is that we don't have the monitors on the ground, the international monitors on the ground, that, um, that we should under, uh, under previous agreements. Um, by the way, the media also, um, under these agreements, um, should be allowed into Kosovo, into Kosovo. And as you know, um, uh, the Serbs, President Milosevic, have kept the media out. So our reporting on this is not as accurate as we'd like. Yes? So there's a problem with the uh, ground observers not getting in. Is there any consideration being given to bring in some overhead assets? Uh, to, to do some surveillance? Well, as I said, we have not ruled out any options for uh, future um, activities in the area, and I don't want to get into more detail than that. Okay. Realizing that, that, that without monitors we don't have that good a handle on this, some people have tossed around the ethnic cleansing word in, in connection with these recent operations. Is this counterinsurgency, or has this crossed a line over into Something else. I think that's not entirely clear. And um, I think what my colleague uh, uh, Jamie Rubin said yesterday was that it looks like a replay um, of, of ethnic cleansing. We don't have uh, firm details yet on what's happening. It does appear that whatever has been happening has slowed down a little today compared to yesterday and the day before. Uh, but, and we hope that trend continues. But uh, I can't say whether, uh, uh, whether it'll become more calm uh, than, than it was over the last couple of days. Any more questions on this? Yes. Uh, not on this subject. I'm sorry. On something closer to home. Uh, another subcommittee hearing on the Senate side heard testimony on um, biological and chemical attacks here in the United States. I know recently you held uh, this weekend some drills on the possibility of these kind of attacks here in the United States, but what is the, the Pentagon or the Department of Defense doing to prepare for such an attack? Uh, would it be possible, and what are you doing to prevent such, such an attack? Well, we have actually a, a, a very extensive program 
um, and that program is getting more robust all the time. Um, obviously, our first concern is force protection and making sure that our forces are able to do their job in any type of uh, battle environment. So we have been uh, putting more money into um, detection. We've been putting more money into uh, uh, protective clothing, better protective clothing, more protective clothing. We, of course, have made a decision to uh, vaccinate everybody in the active duty and reserve force against anthrax. And uh, that has started. More than 40,000 people in the Gulf have already been vaccinated. Um, we have uh, uh, signed a contract to buy a, uh, a large variety of vaccines and to stockpile those vaccines to protect our troops against um, other types of biological toxins beyond anthrax, for instance. Um, uh, a plague is the type of thing we'd be looking at. Uh, in the building here in the country itself, um, we are not primarily responsible for uh, dealing with terrorism or dealing with the types of, uh, of uh, villainous people who may use um, biological or chemical weapons. Um, but we are working with FEMA and other agencies to the train uh, uh, indigenous law enforcement forces in 120 cities, so-called first responders, uh, to help them deal with uh, chemical and biological and other types of terrorism. And in addition, uh, Secretary Cohen announced in March that we are uh, setting up a, um, a, a guard reserve program to help them um, uh, have uh, teams that will, rapid reaction teams that will be able to deploy in support of domestic law enforcement agencies should they be needed. And I think we're setting up, uh, we will set up the first 10 of these teams in uh, 1999, fiscal 1999, which begins October 1st. And we actually had a fairly extensive briefing on that and can get you a, uh, a copy of the uh, transcript. In the building itself, we did have this, uh, we did have an exercise, a uh, cloudy office last weekend, and uh, chemicals were part of the exercise. It involved a group of, uh, of insurgents who broke into the Secretary of Defense's office, and uh, in the course of taking hostages, some chemicals were inadvertently released. And this exercise was designed to uh, test our ability to deal with casualties, um, to decontaminate people very quickly, and to hold the, uh, the health impact uh, uh, to a minimum. I think it was a very successful exercise in uh, showing where we're strong and where we need to be stronger. Um, we've been uh, uh, taking a number of other steps, which I probably shouldn't get into right now, uh, to deal with the possibility of chemical or biological attack close to the Pentagon, and we'll continue to, uh, to pay attention to that. Health care officials yesterday said that uh, while you are working with FEMA and local law enforcement agents to prevent civilians from being harmed, they said not enough is being done and health care officials from Mississippi to Virginia are saying, you know, these people are not even prepared and the 120 cities you mentioned that you guys are working with to prevent this from happening, the uh, committee hearing yesterday came out with the conclusion that none of these people are prepared for not even between now and a year from now to be prepared to prevent such attack on civilians? Well, first, of course we can always do more. Um, this is a, a problem that has only emerged recently um, uh, uh, on the uh, national consciousness. It's uh, one that the uh, President has become uh, personally involved with and the Secretary of Defense as well. And we are beginning to take actions, I think, at an accelerating pace. Second, I want to point out that the United States military is not responsible for uh, protecting people in the United States against domestic, um, uh, uh, domestic criminality. That's the job of police forces. And we cannot, um, just as we cannot make the entire world safe, the U.S. military cannot make every, every cannot train doctors in every town in the country. Um, we are working aggressively and appropriately with um, all sorts of agencies uh, to uh, make sure that we all learn the same lessons and work together to deal with these problems. But ultimately, uh, communities themselves and states are going to have to uh, begin to figure out how to deal with these problems on their own. And uh, yes, there's a lot more to do. Um, 
And yes, we're doing our best to address these problems. But remember, um, what the military does is strictly limited by a series of laws that, um, uh, that restrict what we do domestically. And we only provide support to domestic law enforcement and, uh, and uh, health care agencies. Charlie. Ken, what's the status of the IG investigation into the Linda trip? Uh, um, I do not know what the status is. It's, I, certainly, I know that it's ongoing, and I don't know how far it is from completion. Yes, Pat. I just had a couple of questions about the morale paper. Uh, is it Mr. Tarbell's uh, organization that recommended uh, that there was a violation of national security in the morale review of the Chinese analysis of the Long March explosion? Is it uh, just his, or did it go up through the chain of command? I don't want content so much as I want uh, procedure. The, um, well, first of all, what I can say on this is somewhat limited because it's, this whole issue is the subject to an ongoing criminal investigation which um, has been initiated by, by this administration, by this government, um, following the launch failure in, uh, in 1996 and the post-failure review. Um, the job of, uh, of the Defense Technology uh, Security Agency is to uh, make sure that um, important defense technology is not uh, improperly uh, conveyed to other countries, and so it takes it. It uh, provides advice on uh, the licensing of technology transfers, and it also has a capability uh, working with other um, elements of the uh, military uh, to evaluate um, when transfers uh, do take place and what might be the impact created by those transfers. And that's what, uh, what the DTSA did in this case. It, um, it evaluated what happened and, uh, and, on, and sent a report about that uh, to the State Department. And, uh, and that report um, was then forwarded to the Justice Department, which um, launched a, uh, an investigation. And that investigation is ongoing. Did uh, that report go through Mr. Warner, Mr. Slocum, uh, Department of Defense to State Department, or did it go directly from Mr. Tarbell's shop to the State I Department? I think it went through normal uh, licensing channels. That's my uh, that's my impression. The superiors, uh, or just his I, I believe that it went through normal licensing channels of, uh, so it went through his shop um, over to the State Department. Well, I've seen news accounts saying the Air Force, uh, uh, Air Force Intelligence, supported uh, the view that there was a, a violation of national security. Is this the DIA, an Air Force guy in DIA, or is this specifically Air, uh, Air Force intelligence operation part supporting they, they, Mr. Tarr? They relied on some work by a specific office within the Air Force in, in reaching their conclusion. But not which the is, DIA which is, in this instance? No. Yes, Jim. Uh, I have a question about the Gulf. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, uh, General Hawley uh, said that he would like to see U.S. Air Forces in the Gulf reduced to below the November pre-crisis levels. And I was wondering if that's a, um, an option that's being um, uh, uh, that's under consideration and, and whether that, that would be a goal that uh, Secretary Cohen would share. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll try to find it out. Yes, Bill. Uh, yes, uh, Ken, uh, today is uh, sadly the ninth anniversary of the massacre at Tiananmen. And uh, I, I would like to ask specifically about India. The Indian government has said that their, their primary concern is China, as, as far as their nuclear development is concerned. Uh, their defense minister said this. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, today, uh, the uh, South China Morning Post says, Mr. Jiang, the president of, uh, of, Ch of China, has said about India, they have aspired for a long period of time to be the main power of South Asia. And then Mr. Jiang said he was surprised by the tests, which clearly show, quote, India is targeting 
China and Pakistan. So apparently China and India think that they are each other's uh, rivals in this, nu in this nuclear matter. Does the United States uh, uh, see it that way? And why is this country so silent about China's role in, in, in uh, the nuclear uh, matters in, uh, in the Indian subcontinent? Well, first of all, in answer to your first question, I think I'll let the uh, Chinese and Indian officials you quoted speak for themselves. I think they are probably better able to assess their own security concerns than I am. Um, this government's position is very clear. We think that an arms race uh, in South Asia is dangerous and destabilizing. And uh, Secretary Albright is in Geneva today working to try to stop that arms race. I think it's significant that the chairman of this meeting is the, uh, is the Chinese foreign minister. Um, this is the P5, the permanent uh, five nuclear power group that's the P5 on the UN Security Council. And um, I believe that uh, China itself would like to uh, um, uh, stop an arms race uh, uh, in South Asia. And um, we will have to see what comes out of those meetings. There's a second meeting in London, I think, over the weekend, the so-called G8 meeting, which is a, a broader, broader group. And, and um, that will also be important. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, have a, I have a question on that. You guys have now gotten a response from Lockheed to your cure notice, and I'm wondering what the Pentagon plans to do. Uh, fire them, get on the second floor? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I haven't seen the response. Um, we are looking at, um, uh, at, uh, at other uh, uh, contracting uh, possibilities, having a second contractor involved in the program. And uh, we're looking also, we're looking at two things. One. Um, how to get the current contractor to uh, to solve the problems, and uh, and try to get the program back on track. And two, looking at a second contractor for the program. But I'm not aware that decisions have been made yet. What are this building's concerns <coughs> over the Chinese arms merchant ship heading to Pakistan? Mm -hmm. Well, I can't um, uh, comment uh, obviously on specific intelligence matters. The uh, the story. Uh, uh, pointed out um, uh, after the first paragraph that uh, this uh, seemed to be bearing um, anti-tank missiles. And we know that uh, China has had a long supply relationship uh, with Pakistan um, uh, supplying anti-tank missiles. And uh, we don't regard that as a dangerous act of proliferation. Um, these are uh, designed to help uh, Pakistan uh, protect its own forces against tank attack. In fact, um, in the past, the United States has sold anti-tank missiles to Pakistan as well. Thank you. Thank you.